All right, welcome back everyone to a brand new Nest.js tutorial. In this tutorial, I'm going to show you all how we can build a Nest.js API using MongoDB to store our data. This is a very highly requested video. Many people who have seen my previous Nest.js tutorials have asked for MongoDB and Mongoose. So here it is. So what we'll do is we'll set up a couple of API endpoints where we can create some data and read some data. And then I'll show you how we can use Mongoose to search for our data that's in the MongoDB database. I'll also show you how we can update data as well as delete data as well. I'm also going to be using MongoDB Compass as our GUI to look at our data as well. So that way we don't have to worry about using the Mongo shell to write Mongo query statements to get our data. You can use whatever graphical user interface you want for MongoDB. I'm just going to keep it simple and use MongoDB Compass because this is what it came with when I installed MongoDB. Yeah, so let's go ahead and get started with setting up our project. I'm sure most of you already know what MongoDB is. So I'm not going to go into what MongoDB is or what it isn't. So let's set up our Nest project. So I'll type in my Windows PowerShell Nest new MongoDB or Nest.js MongoDB. I'll use NPM as my package manager. Okay, and uh, this will take a little bit of time for it to scaffold, but I will also mention that we only have two packages that we need to install. We're going to install the base mongoose package, uh, and then we're also going to install the Nest.js wrapper as well. So I'm going to move this to my other screen, and we'll wait for this to finish installing. Shouldn't take too long. And now we'll CD into the Nest.js MongoDB project that was just generated. So CD Nest.js. MongoDB, and let's go ahead and open up Visual Studio Code, and we have our project, so that's good. Before we do anything else, I'll just simply install my dependencies, so let's type npm i at nest.js slash mongoose, and then space mongoose. I don't think we'll need any other dependencies, so that will be good. We'll keep this project pretty lightweight. All right, perfect. So we have it all set up. Let's go ahead and run everything to make sure it works. So we'll type npm run start colon dev. And we should have our project up and running. Great, it's working. Before we write any code, let me just quickly delete a couple files. So I'm not going to use any of this base stuff that is generated, so I'll delete. App controller spec.ts, that's the test file. I'll delete the actual controller file as well, and I'll delete the service file. You don't need to delete it, you can keep it if you want to. I'm going to remove this as well, and then this. Okay, nothing we need to do for main.ts. So now let's actually make the connection to the database. That's the very first thing we need to do, or that we should do. So We'll go inside app.module.ts and we want to import mongoose module. And this will come from at nest.js slash mongoose. That's the package that we just installed. And this is the module itself. So what we'll do is in the imports array, we will reference mongoose module and we'll call dot for root. And then we're going to go ahead and pass in the mongo URI. So that's the URI string that we can use to connect to the MongoDB database. So most of you should know uh, what this looks like already. So I'll show you an example of the documentation. So right over here you can see that they have MongoDB uh, colon forward slash forward slash. So that's the MongoDB protocol. And then the localhost. So they don't include the port because typically the default port for MongoDB is 27017. But if you, of course, have MongoDB running on a different port, then you need to make sure you specify that. So what I'll do is I'll type MongoDB colon forward slash forward slash. One thing that I will mention is that if you actually use localhost for some reason, this is happening to me. I don't know if it'll happen to some of you all. But if you do just localhost, then I'll just type in some random name for the database. When I run the application, it actually does not connect to the database. Um, there actually should be more logs happening over here. But if I change this to 127.0.0.1, it then works. I'm not too sure why that's the case. Maybe someone 
down below can comment why if they know. But yeah, I mean, I'm not using MongoDB on Docker or anything like that. It's just, it's installed on my computer. So the local host should work, but it doesn't, so it's strange. Okay, so this is good. We have our URI, of course. If you needed to specify a port, you would just do it after the host name. So 27017. We don't need to do that because by default, it is 27017. And if you had authentication, let's say you were using a username and password, you would want to have that uh, before the host name. So it looks something like this. Let's say my username is test and then my password is test123. So you would have test colon test123 at the host name and then forward slash and then this is the database name that you want to use. Okay, so username colon password and then at host name. So that's the format. But since uh, my local MongoDB server does not have any authentication enabled, by default, it doesn't. So I'm not going to worry about that. But of course, if you're using MongoDB in production, you need to make sure you do have authentication. Okay. But also recommend using uh, encryption as well, like some kind of certificate to make sure that everything is encrypted. Now, the next thing that we need to do is we need to create some schemas in Mongoose. Because schemas is what is going to define our application data. So for example, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a user schema because I want to represent users in my application. Let's go ahead and create a schema for that. Let's create a new folder. I'll call this models. Uh, actually, I'm going to read the schemas. Because schemas and models are actually different in the terminology for Mongoose. So that's why I wanted to uh, respect that. So let's create a new file. I'll call this user.schema.ts. And then what we're going to do is we're going to create a class and we'll call this user. And then to tell Mongoose that this is going to be a schema, we just simply use the at schema decorator and it comes from Mongoose. So now when we actually register our schema, it will take this user and it'll actually create a collection in the database to represent these user these users in our application okay um let's see what's going on over here oh whoops uh, it's supposed to be imported from at nestjs slash mongoose not the base mongoose package that's why it was giving us this error okay perfect all right, so now we can go ahead and define some fields for our user class. So a user, will, of course, will have a name or username string. And we'll use the at prop decorator. Uh, I guess I can't import that here. So we'll just have to manually import it. It comes from the nest.js mongoose package. And then we'll invoke that. And then let's go ahead and do a couple more fields. So let's do prop. Let's do a display name string as well. Uh, what else? Let's do prop. And for this prop or this field, uh, we'll do avatar URL. So what I want to do for the username field is I want to mark this as a unique field because uh, let's say if you're building a website and you have authentication you want to have users you don't want users that have the same username obviously so we can mark this username field as unique so that way if we try to save a user with a username that already exists in the database then it will throw an error so it won't allow you to save duplicates based on whatever the value of username is okay uh, for display name, uh, I can also do something like this where I can set the required field to true or false if I wanted to. So if you want display name to be required, then you can set this to true. Or if you want it to not be required, then you can set it to false. I'll do the same thing for username. I'll set required to true. Okay, and then for display name, since I want this to be uh, not required to have it set to false. So I'll also add the optional operator next to it. So that way our TypeScript code knows 
that display name can be undefined. Same thing for avatar URL. The user might not have an avatar set, so we'll just add the question mark, and then we'll set required to false. Okay, so that's pretty much how we can create a schema and then define its schema fields. So now what we need to do is we need to go ahead and use this schema factory class. So I'll import this up here from Nest.js Mongoose schema factory. So this is a class right over here. And then this class schema factory has a static method called create for class. Okay, so right over here, we actually just created a class. We actually didn't create a schema. However, this schema decorator tells Mongoose that this is going to be the represented uh, schema based on this class. In order to actually create the actual schema, we need to use this create for class method. Okay, so we're going to pass in this user class right over here as an argument. And then we're going to go ahead and store this return value because this returns a schema. We're going to store it inside a variable and we're also going to export that variable. So I'll use export const and I'll call this user schema. And there we go. So now we can see that the user schema variable, the data type is schema. Okay. And of course it's a generic type and it's type annotated with the user class itself as well as the uh, mongoose model. Okay, so we're done with setting up our user schema. Now, the next thing that we need to do is register our schema with Mongoose module. Now, what I would recommend is creating a user module for your Nest.js app. So that way you can keep everything in its respective module. So what I'll do is I'll create a new folder called users. And then inside users, I'll create a new file called user users.module.ts and we're gonna just pretty much create a user a users module class like this and then we're gonna use the module decorator that comes from um it should come from nest.js common i'm gonna just copy that import so import module from nest.js common we're gonna call this module decorator or this function which is a decorator and I'll use the imports array right over here. And what I want to do is I want to go ahead and reference mongoose module. So I'm going to import this as well from the nest.js mongoose package. And I'm going to go ahead and call the for feature method. Okay. And I'm going to pass in this array, which is an array of model definitions. You can see the type right over here. Okay. And then what I want to do is I want to pass in the model definitions object. So that's what's going to actually uh, register our Mongo schemas. Okay. So that way it will actually create those collections or recognize the collections in the actual Mongo DB database. So there's two properties that we need. First one is name. This will be uh, the name of your class itself. So in this case, I have a user class. You can name it whatever you want, really, but I'm just going to name it based off of the name of the class right over here, it's user. So I'll import the user class and then I'll reference the dot name property. Okay, this name property is going to be on every single class itself. And then we're going to pass in this schema property, which will have the value of the user schema right over here. So we need to import that. All right, so there we go. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and go into our app.module.ts and we'll just register the users module by just simply importing it. So users module. So I just imported that right from this user users.module.ts file. And then let's double check our logs. Okay, there's no errors, that's good. So what we'll do now, we will go ahead and create a users service class, which is going to be responsible for interacting with our data layer, our MongoDB database. To do that, we need to inject our user model into that service class. So inside the users folder, 
in the same file or in the same folder where the user's module file is. I'll create a new file and I'll call this users.service.ts. Okay. And what I'm going to do now is I'll create a class and I'll call this users service. And then I'll go ahead and use the injectable decorator, which is going to come from at nestjs slash common. So let's import that right here. And then now that we have created our class and then we use the injectable decorator to mark this class as an injectable, what we can do now is we can begin injecting the model that we want to use. So I'm going to create a constructor and in the constructor args, we're going to use this inject model decorator, which is imported from at nestjs slash mongoose. So it's comes from right here and then the argument that goes into this inject model decorator is going to be the name of our model so it's going to match whatever name you specified for uh, right over here your model definitions so since my name for our user model is user.name which is just going to be the name of the class I'm going to go ahead and import the user class not the scheme of the class so that will be this class right over here. And then I'm going to go ahead and reference the dot name property, which is a property that is on every single class. So it pretty much just resolves to the class name itself. And then I'm going to go ahead and use the private keyword and then I'll name the argument user model. And then we can type annotate this using the model generic type from a mongoose. So you can see model is an interface that is imported from mongoose, not nest.js mongoose, just the regular plain mongoose package. And then this is a generic type. So we can, whoops, we can use less than greater than brackets to specify which type. So we'll pass an user like that. Okay. So now that we have injected our user model, we can actually start using this to interact with the database before we can do that though uh we need to go ahead and take this user's service and add it as a provider so we'll go into the users.module.ts file and then right after imports i'm going to add this providers key and this is going to be an array as well and all we'll do is we'll just pass in the user's service class as an argument in side the array or it's going to be as an element so users service so that is going to be import right over here and you can see now we have our providers and of course remember how earlier we registered the users module so whatever providers that we have registered here will also be registered inside um, this app module as well and let's just double check our logs and make sure everything's okay and there are no errors so that's good so what we'll do next is we'll simply go back to our users service file and we'll create a couple of functions that will perform some kind of business logic. So let's go ahead and do this. We need basic operations that will, um, you know, that will be responsible for creating and reading data from our MongoDB database. So what I'll do now is inside our users service class, I'll go ahead and define and implement a couple of methods that will interact with our database. So we'll go ahead and start off with a simple create user method. And what I'll do is for the arguments, we're going to pass in an object into this create user method. I'm going to name the argument create user DTO. Now DTO stands for data transfer object. This is a very popular pattern amongst Next, Nest.js and the developers encourage everyone to use DTOs, data transfer objects, because it's a very common pattern in many different frameworks. And it's actually a very simple thing to do. So all really this is just going to be is an object, but we're gonna type annotate it with a class definition. So we're gonna create a DTO file 
So I'm going to go inside the users folder and I'll create a new folder called DTO. And I'll go ahead and create a new file and I'll call this user.dto.ts. And what I'll do is I'll create a simple class and I'll call it create user DTO. And I should probably rename this from user.dto.ts to create user because you want it to represent the actual object itself. Okay, and the object is relevant to the uh, fields that you're going to pass in when you create a user. So we're going to go ahead and define the fields that we expect the client to send over to the server whenever they're trying to create a user. So of course we want this to also be very similar to how we have our user schema set up. So for our user schema, we'll have a username, display name, avatar URL. Of course, the username is primarily the only thing that is required. So display name and avatar URL are not required. But we can also include that as well as part of the DTO. So what I'll do is I'll define the username field as well as the display name field. I'll mark display name as optional. But I won't define an avatar URL field for our create user DTO. That's because typically, um, it really depends on how you implement your application. If you create a user and then you have them upload an image, then yes, it would make sense to have an avatar URL or some kind of um, uh, binary data right over here as a field that's sent to the server. But in this case, I'll just say, you know what, we don't expect the user to set a profile picture until after they've created their account. So we won't provide, we won't ask for an avatar URL for this create user DTO. Another thing that you might be wondering is why are we not just simply reusing our user class that we created earlier? Keep in mind that this user class is, to, is supposed to represent our MongoDB collection. And there might be fields in here that don't necessarily pertain to a request body for creating a user or performing some kind of put request or patch request. So for example, you might have some fields that are part of the user definition for our database that is not needed when you're trying to create the user. So that is why we're not reusing that user class. So I just wanted to mention that. So now, since we are using DTOs though, and this is just a very important thing when it comes to building CRUD applications, is you wanna make sure you are validating your data. Because remember, this is going to be a class that we're using to represent our data being transferred from the client to the server, or from server to server, whatever. We also wanna make sure we're validating our data as we're receiving it. So to do that, we can actually install two packages. So what I'll do is I'll go into my terminal and I'll install class validator and class transformer. And this will allow us to actually use the built-in validation pipe that's part of Nest.js to actually validate our data as we are receiving it. And like I said, you always have to make sure you're perform performing validation on the client side as well as the server side, okay? So what we'll do is let's restart our server. So npm run start colon dev. And we're gonna go back to the DTO. Let's make sure everything's okay. It is. So what I can do now in my create user DTO for each field, I can use uh, these decorators that come from class validator. So you can see right over here, if I just type is, capital I and a lowercase s, you can see all of these different decorators come from class validator. So for username, the one that I want is I want is not empty. So that will ensure that this username field is not empty. I can also make sure that it is a string as well. I need to make sure this is imported from class validator. I'll just manually import it. And for display name, I can also, um, I don't need to do anything for display name because this itself is already optional. Um, so what I can do is I can simply use the is string decorator to ensure that this is going to be a string and nothing that is not a string. So it won't be a Boolean, uh, it won't be a numeric value, okay? And of course, if the validation fails, it'll just throw an error. So you don't have to worry about that. So now what I'm going to do simply is I'm going to take this create user DTO class. I'm going to type annotate with create user DTO right over here. 
And remember, we're in the users service class right now. So by the time that this create user method is called, the validation has already occurred. And that's simply because the validation will happen. And then once the validation happens, the data will actually be usable on the controller layer. And then from there on, you can pass it to wherever you want which typically you would pass the data from the control layer down to the service layer. So we can assume that the validation at this point is all good. So what we'll do is we'll actually create our user document. So this is going to be pretty simple. I'll first create a variable called user or new user, and I'll use a new keyword and I'll reference our user model by using the this keyword. So this dot user model. And then what I can simply do is I can pass in this partial, which is going to be an object that will have the fields that you want to use to create the user. So I can actually just simply pass in this create user DTO because remember our DTO is defined in such a way that the fields do overlap. So what I can do now is I can simply just call new user. So this will give you this document type and you can just simply call save to save the user to the database. Okay. So once we have done that, we need to actually go ahead and go into our users folder and we'll create a controller now. So users.controller.ts. So I'll create the users controller. So this will allow us to serve endpoints to our clients to interact with. So I'll create a class called users controller. And I need to use the controller decorator, which is going to be imported from at nestjs slash common. So let me import that from at nestjs slash common. Okay, and then we need to, of course, map a route to our controller. So the route for users controller will be mapped to users. So before I do anything else, let me register our users controller. So I'm going to take our users controller and go into users.module.ts. And then there's going to be uh, inside this object for our module decorator. We can specify this controllers property, which is an array as well. And then we can go ahead and simply import users controller. And now if I show you guys the logs, you can see that now it says users controller is uh, mapped and you can see that this slash users endpoint is now mapped to the users controller so that's good so we know that it is working but we need uh, actual methods or route handlers in order for our endpoint to work so we need a post request for create user so i'm going to create a method called create user and i'm going to use the post decorator which is also going to be imported from at nestjs slash common and now this will map the slash users endpoint via a post request to this create user method. So if I were to simply go into my HTTP client, so I'll be using Postman as an example to test everything. I can just simply make a post request to slash users and it will call this create user method. Okay. So now what I'll do is I need to go ahead and actually inject our users service class into users controller because remember the controller is going to interact with the service layer and the service layer will be responsible for interacting with the data layer or other external apis okay so what i'll do is i will implement the constructor and i will inject the users service class using uh, the constructor so i'll simply use the private keyword and I'll name the argument users service and I'll type annotate this with the users service class. And this is how you use constructor injection to inject this users service provider. So what I can do is inside my create user method is I can actually reference the users service and then I can invoke this create user method. But of course we need our arguments. We need the request body that is going to be sent to this endpoint. Okay, so in order to retrieve the request body, all we need to do is just use this at body decorator, and I'm going to import that as well from at nestjs slash common. Okay, and then 
all we need to do is just give this argument a name. So I'll call this uh, create user DTO and I'll type annotate with create user DTO. And what I'll do is I'm not going to do anything just yet except for just console logging this DTO. And then I'm going to make a post request right now inside Postman. So I'm on Postman right now. You can use whatever HTTP client you want. VS Code does have an extension that you can download. I think it's called a Thunder client that you can use. So you can use that to test your endpoints. But I just like using Postman. So let me change this to a post request. And I'll type in the URL, which is going to be HTTP colon forward slash forward slash localhost. I think I'm running on port 3000. So 3000 forward slash users. And notice how now it's going to say 201 created. But you're probably wondering, well, I didn't send any data to the back end. You can see right now the data is actually um, empty. It's an empty object. But the problem here is that we have these decorators right over here. Why was the validation not happening? Why did the validation not work? Well, the reason why the validation did not work is because we actually did not uh, enable the validation. We need to do that before we can actually have it working. And it's actually pretty easy to do that. There's two ways that you can do this. One, you can enable validation globally. So going back to our main.ts file, and inside here, we can enable the validation. So I just reference app. So that's this app variable right over here. And then dot use global, global pipes. And then you just need to create an instance of validation pipe. And this is going to be imported from doesn't want to auto import. This is going to be imported from, let me just fix that. Yeah, it's going to be imported from at nestjs slash common. So now this will enable a validation globally at the entire application level. So all of your endpoints will uh, have validation. So if I go back to Postman, if I click send, you're going to see now it's going to actually perform the validation. If you prefer not to enable it globally, but would rather enable it uh, on each endpoint, you can also do that as well. So you can use this use pipes decorator on the method. So this create user method over here. So this will ensure that validation will occur. So use pipes. I'm going to import that manually since my imports are messed up. And then all you do is just use new validation pipe. I'm going to import that up here as well. Validation pipe. Just like that. Okay, and now if I go back into Postman, you can see that validation will occur and only for this specific endpoint. So it's not enabled globally, but just for this specific endpoint. Okay, so we'll leave it like this for now. Uh, so what I'll do now is I'm just go back and close this and let's go back into Postman and let's send some data. So we'll send a JSON. So I'm gonna go to body, and then click raw and then select JSON. And then I'll specify username. And I'll say hello. And display name should actually uh, be not required. So I think I need to use the is optional decorator to mark this as optional. So let me try that now. Okay, there we go. And if I look in the request body, you can see I have username right over here. So what we'll do next is we will just simply pass this DTO down to user's service. So uh, I'm going to just do return this dot user's service dot create user, pass in that DTO. It's the same type annotation, so we can just pass in, pass in like this. And now we should be able to create users because we had set everything up already. We have the user service, and then we have our create user method inside the user service class implement already. So this should create the user and save it to the database. So what I'll do is I'll go back to Postman. Let me change the username to Anson. And then I'll click send. And you can see now, because what I did here, let me go back to the controller. I'm just simply returning this um, create, the, the return value of what a create user is. So it does end up returning a document. And Nest.js will handle um, this for us so we don't have to so like for example in express you have to do something like response.send you don't have to do it in sjs i'm sure many of you already know already you can just simply just return and then 
turn this value over here. So you can see now it's just going to return this document. So you can say username Anson, the ID, okay? And then it has this underscore underscore V property, which is just a version key. So I'm gonna go ahead and try to create uh, the same document with the username being Anson again, just to show you what happens if we, if we try to create a duplicate record. So if I click send, now you see it says uh, status code 500, internal server error. Of course, we need to make sure we handle our errors accordingly. But what is really happening underneath the hood is it's giving us this duplicate key error collection. Okay. And again, see it says nest.js um, tutorial users index username one duplicate key username Anson. So that shows you that because we had that unique constraint set on that username field, that if we try to create another document in the user's collection with the same username, it's going to throw an error. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense, but I'll go ahead and try to create another user this time setting the display name and I'll just do, let's try a different name. Let's try Jack the developer and I'll set the username to Jack. Click send. And you can see now that we have username Jack display name Jack the developer. And if I go into my MongoDB compass, uh, let me refresh. Let me zoom in a little bit. You can see now if I click on Nest.js tutorial, and if I click on users, you can see I have all of my data right over here. I have username Anson, uh, I have Jack, and then display name. So pretty cool. We are saving data to our MongoDB database, so that's wonderful. All right, so let's go ahead and do a couple other operations with our database. So what I'll do is I'll go into uh, let's see, let's go, I'll go into users.service.ts and I want to be able to get all the users. So I'll create a method called get users and we don't need any arguments for this. So at least not right now. So what we'll do is we will simply just, uh, I guess what we can do is we can return this dot user model and then there should be a method called find and you can see that this will return an array of documents which will be of type user and that's all we need to do for that so now let's go ahead and create an endpoint for getting all users so i'll use this get decorator so i'm going to import that up top from at nestjs slash common so get we'll call this decorator and then I'll just call this method get users okay so now we have a get request uh, for slash users mapped to this method right over here and then all we need to do is just reference this dot users service and then we just call get users and it'll return whatever get users returns which is going to be an array of all the users in the database let's go back into Postman, I'm going to create a new tab and I'll just do uh, localhost port 3000 slash users. Click send and see how now we have an array of all of our users. All right, so that's pretty cool. So let's go ahead and create a couple of more operations for our application. So we have create user, we have get users. Let's go ahead and try uh, get user by ID. So back in my users service class, I'll create a method called get user by ID. And this will expect an ID for the user. So the ID will be a string. And what we can do to get this user is this. So I'll return this dot user model. And then we're going to go ahead and call uh, find by ID. So this will search for a single user in the collection. So we just pass the ID like that. Okay, and keep in mind the ID in this case is going to be that auto-generated ID that uh, that MongoDB will auto-generate for each document. So that's the ID that I'm referring to. See, so notice how the documentation over here says it's underscore ID field, which is auto-generated. Okay. So let's go ahead and go back to the controller. And what we'll do is we will set up another get request, but this time I need to... Uh, add an extra 
path at the end of the slash user route. So that's going to be a route parameter. So I'm going to do colon ID. So our endpoint will look like slash users slash colon ID. So we need the user's ID passed in as a route parameter to get the single user from the database. So I'm going to call this get user by ID the method that will be mapped to this route. And then now in order to get the actual route parameter, we can simply use this at param decorator. I'm going to import that as well from at nestjs slash common. So at param, and then you want to provide the route parameter name. So it's going to be just ID and I'm going to name it ID and then type annotated to be a string. Okay, so now what I can do is I can simply reference user service and then call our new get user by ID method. But I'm going to also do some checks as well. Because what I want to do is I want to uh, call this method and store the value in a variable. So let's do that. So let's do const find user equals. And since this get user by ID method is going to return a promise, we need to use async await uh, inside our controller for get user by ID function because we are calling that asynchronous method. So we need to use async await for that. So I'm going to use async get user by ID and then await this dot users service dot get user by ID. And we'll pass in that ID right there. So now what I can do is I can simply do if there's no user, I can throw a new HTTP and there shouldn't be this built in exception that is part of nest.js. Yeah, HTTP exception. And I need to import that. I think that's coming from common as well. So HTTP uh, exception. And then I can pass in, uh, let's see, the response. So a message, I can say user not found. And then as a second argument for the HTTP exception constructor, I can pass in a status code. So I'll pass in 404, which means not found. All right, so now uh, what I can do is I can return find user, which I know by this point the user has been found. Now, here's one thing that we should also do before we actually do anything else is we should actually check to see if this ID is a valid um, object ID because note that the object ID in MongoDB collection for, for your documents, it might look like a string, but it's actually an object ID type. So we should actually double check to make sure it's a valid um, object ID. Otherwise, it's going to throw an error. So let's say, for example, if I leave it like this right now, and what I'll do is I'll go into Postman and I'll copy the ID of this document, and I'll go ahead and test out the uh, endpoint. So I'll go to slash users and I'll pass in this ID, and you can see it works just fine. But when I go ahead and pass in a random string, Instead of getting 404, we actually get a status code of 500 internal server error. And the reason why that happens is because it's trying to cast this into an actual object ID, which of course is going to fail. So what we can do to solve this, there's, there's many different ways that you can do this. But what I would recommend is we check to see if the object ID is valid. So this is actually pretty easy, and although I would recommend doing this inside a middleware, uh, because that would make the most sense, just to keep things simple, um, I'm going to do it inside. Um, I'm going to do it right over here, right before we actually call get user by ID, because this is actually what's going to throw the error when, when I call get user by ID, and then it's going to call this dot user model dot find by ID, and then we pass in this uh, ID, and it tries to do the casting, it doesn't work, throws the error. So I'm going to do it right before I call this.userService.getUserById. So it's actually really easy. What we can do is we can use this mongoose. So I'm going to import that up top over here, mongoose from mongoose. And I'm going to go and reference, uh, let's see, types.objectID is valid. And I'm going to pass in that string, that ID right over here. Okay. And this will actually return a boolean. So const is valid equals 
whatever this value returns. So if it is not valid, then we know that the ID is not valid. So what I'll do is I'll just simply throw an HTTP exception of user not found 404. Okay. I don't want to tell the user that the ID is invalid. I don't want to tell the user anything else but just say that the user is not found. So now I'll go back to Postman and I'll click send. And now you see it says 404 user not found. So this is uh, how I would recommend you to handle errors in your application. Okay, don't let it error out to a status code of 500 because 500 is typically for anything that is wrong with the server itself, not with issues like this where the user is not found. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. All right, so now I'm going to show you all how we can update data in our MongoDB database. So first, what I'll do is I'll set up an endpoint that will allow us to modify parts of our user document. So the best HTTP method for this would be a patch request. So we're going to use a patch request to update parts of our user document. So it's going to we're going to import this patch decorator up top over here from at slash common. And I want to be able to update parts of our document, not the entire document itself. So typically the difference between put and patch is they are both used to update data. But put is really just to update the entire resource where patch is for modifying parts of the resource itself. So we're not trying to update the entire user record. We just, we just want to update parts of it. So for example, if I look at my MongoDB Compass graphical user interface, let's say, for example, I want to update this user right over here where it has no display name. So I only want to modify just a part of this document by simply adding a display name to it i don't want to update the entire document itself hopefully that makes sense so what i'll do is for the id we can actually pass in the id the same way that we pass it in as a get request so we can grab the id from the route parameter so i'm going to go ahead and call this method update user and then what we want to do is we want to specify in our request body what fields we want to allow the client to be able to modify. So we're going to need a request body. So what I'll do is inside our DTL folder, I'll create a new file. I'll call this update user.dto.ts. And I'll create a class called update user DTL. And now here I will define fields where uh, we can actually use those fields to update the record in the database. So if I look at my user schema, I can see that I have three fields total. I have a username, I have a display name, and I also have an avatar URL. So of course, we don't want to allow the user to update their username. Well, in some cases, you might allow that to happen. But let's just keep it simple and prevent the user from updating their database. Once they've created their account, they can no longer update their username. But we can allow them to update their display name, their avatar URL. If they have an email address, we can allow them to update that as well. We'll keep it simple and just use just display name and avatar URL. Because currently I have these values as optional. So if we can create the user without these properties, that would of course work. But then we want to allow the user to later on attach these fields to their record in the database. So that's where the update user endpoint comes in handy. So what I'll do is I will simply uh, set display name, set this to string, and this is still going to be optional because you're not expecting the user or expecting the client to update every single property or you're um, you know, forcing them to pass in specific fields. You just want to allow them to pass in whatever fields they want, and then we'll update the database accordingly. So we still want these to be optional. So display name will be optional, and so will avatar. URL will also be optional as well. And we want to make sure since we're using, we're going to be using um, class validator decorators to perform validation. We do need to make sure that we use the is optional decorator to mark these fields as optional. Otherwise, when we register or when we enable validation with our 
update user endpoint, it's going to throw an error because we didn't pass in display name or avatar URL. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. I will also make sure that this is a string as well. So I'm going to import that from class validator as well. And same thing for avatar URL. We'll do that. Okay, so what I'll do is, let's see. I'm going to go ahead and copy this use pipes part. And I'll just paste this right underneath um, the patch decorator call. So that way my update user endpoint or this uh, the route that's mapped to this method will have validation. So we're going to use the body decorator and then we're going to name our argument update user DTO and we're going to type annotate this with update user DTO class that we just created and that will be imported up top over here. You can see import update user DTO from the relative path. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and I need to define a method in the service layer to actually handle uh, the update for the user. So we're going to go into users.service.ts and I'll create a method called update user. And this is of course going to be a two-step process. We need to make sure uh, that the ID is valid, then we can update the user. If the ID is not valid, then of course we can't update the user at all. So not only do we need to grab the request body, we need to grab the route parameter as well, which is going to be the ID. So what I'll do is I will use the at param decorator and let me do this. So at param, I'm going to specify the name of the route parameter, which is just ID without the colon. Okay. And I'm going to name the ID string just like this. Okay. So param and then pass in the string ID like this, and then give it the name ID and type annotate it to be a string, comma, and then the request body right over here. So we're going to do the same thing that we did above for get user by ID. We're going to uh, validate uh, the MongoDB ID. Like I said, I would recommend you to write a middleware because that it would make sense to write a middleware because you're going to be needing to perform this validation on pretty much any endpoint that you're working with MongoDB IDs or document IDs. So I'd highly encourage you all to write a middleware. Maybe if we have some time at the end, I'll do that and show you all how that's done. So I'm going to just copy this and paste this right over here. And what I'll do is I'll say if it's not valid, I'll just simply throw a new HTTP exception. And I guess what I'll do here is I'll just simply say um, invalid ID and I'll set the status code to be 400. And then what I'll do next is, since we know that this ID will is in fact valid, we'll go ahead and go back into the user's service file. And then inside this update user method, we want to take in the ID as well as the DTO. So the ID will be a string, and then the update user DTO will be just of the update user DTO type. That's going to be imported up top over here. So now what I want to do is I want to go ahead and reference this dot user model. And then there's this method called, um, let's, let me show you update one or update many. Of course, we are only dealing with one document. So we're going to use the update one method, but there's also this find one and update as well as find by ID and update. And update one will pretty much just assume that you already know that the values in the database is not going to actually validate that the document is there but if you use find one or whoops find by id and update this will search for the record and then update it if it exists okay so i'd recommend using find by id and update that's a much better appropriate method to use for our situation so what i can do is i can pass in the id because i know that this is a valid ID, a, a document ID, or an object ID, I should really call it that. So the casting from the object ID or from a string to an object ID is going to work just fine. It's not going to throw any errors like we saw earlier when we didn't validate it. So we're going to pass in the ID, and now the second argument is going to be this update query, which is really just going to be an object, and you're going to specify um, what field you want to update. So notice how if I type in display or DI, display name appears. 
Okay, if I wanted to update username, which we don't want them to update the username just yet, so we're going to leave that alone, I could. Uh, and then what's the other one? Avatar URL. So you can see that I can update literally whatever I want. So that's why I created this DTO, because this has our fields defined over here that are all optional. And you'll also notice that all of the fields in this object are optional as well, because you don't need to necessarily update those fields. Whatever you provide in the fields is what it's going to use that value to update the database with. So for example, if I don't provide display name, then it will not touch the display name property, but it will update other parts of the document. So hopefully that makes sense. So I'll just simply pass in this update user DTO object, and I'll just simply return this method call. Okay. So let's go ahead and go back into the controller. And what I'll do is this. I'll return this dot user service update user. So we'll pass in the ID as well as the update user DTO object. So let's go back into Postman. Well, first let's verify that we have no errors. So my logs look all good. We have all of our routes mapped. You can see I have this patch request mapped right now. Let's go back into Postman. And uh, let's see, let's get all the users. So what I'll do is I'll update, uh, I'll update this document. So the username of Anson, I'm gonna add a display name as well as an avatar URL. So I'm gonna create a new request. Uh, we'll use the patch request, and the endpoint is going to be HTTP localhost port 3000 slash users, and then the ID of the user we want to update. So now notice how, right now, if I were just to click send, okay, you'll see that the original document, or at least it looks like the original document, because, you know, we didn't actually pass in any request body at all. So it still went through the whole update part. But of course, it's not going to actually work because we didn't pass in anything for it to update. So it's going to look like the same document. Now, if I tried to pass in, let's say if I try to update this ID to something that's not really in the database, you're going to see that it actually still gives back a 200. It's still a valid object ID, I guess. Um, but it still returns a 200, even though the user was not found. So we can actually modify that. So if it was not found, then we don't do anything. But I think... This return value actually gives back an undefined value, I think, so we can adjust that accordingly. But let's say if I were to just pass in some bizarre ID, and you can see now it actually hits um, this part right over here. And then since is valid, so since this is going to be false, so we say if it's not false, then this is going to be true. Then we throw a new HTTP exception, and then we say invalid ID, and it gives us back a 400 status code. So we know that this logic works. Okay, cool. So let's actually update our document. So let me paste that ID back in. I'm gonna go back to the request body and then change from text to JSON. And what I'll do is I'll pass in display name. I'll set that to ants in the dev. And then let's just leave it like this and let's see what happens. So you can see that gives us back a 200 okay. So it gives us back, I guess, the original document, but if I try to query all the users again, you can see now I get display name. So this actually, this query doesn't actually return the updated document from what I remember. Uh, it actually returns the old document, but there is actually, I think a third parameter that you can pass in. Yep, that's right. And uh, what you can do, so this is going to be an object and this is this query options, let me show you. Uh, query options type and if you actually specify the new property which is a boolean you said it's true it will actually return the new document that was updated or the new version of the update document so you see how when i updated this with display name it returned the original document when i tried to use the user's query or the user's endpoint with a get request it actually gives me the new document so we can confirm that the data is being updated and just to show you all again if i go into my uh mongodb compass if i refresh you can see the display name is there so we know it's updating 100 percent correctly but let's go back into postman and let's just say uh let's update this let's update display name to anton the developer click send and now you'll see that it gives me the updated record not the original one 
if I wanted to set the, uh, let's see, avatar URL, I'm just going to pass in some random string because you don't have any validation checks. You'll see the avatar URL is there. So I just wanted to point that out in case if some of you might have a scenario where you need the actual updated record after you perform an update. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay, let's just kind of tweak this a little bit. So what I'll do is I'll store the value. So I do need to await this method call because it does return a promise. So I'll add the async keyword in front of update user and then I'll do await. And then I just want to console log this just to verify what the actual return value is if there's uh, if the user ID is valid, but the user is not found. So I know that if the user is found though, it will return the actual updated user. What if I modify the ID to something that is not in the database? So if I look at the logs, you'll see it says null. Okay, so that's fine. So what I can do is this. I can simply say, uh, let's do this. If there's no updated user, so if, if it's not null, then we'll throw a new HTTP exception, user not found, and then pass in a 404. Otherwise, we will just return updated user. Okay, so this will do some error checking for us instead of just sending a 200, even though the user ID is invalid. So if I click send again, it gives me back a 404. And if I pass in the valid ID, then it'll give me back a 200. So that's great. And of course, if you don't like to use the route parameter to pass the id you don't necessarily need to you can definitely pass that in uh, as a request body some people prefer to use a request body to uh, specify which user or which resource they're trying to update some people prefer to use route parameters ultimately it doesn't really matter people have their own differences so it's really up to you so hopefully that all makes sense so now you know how to perform updates to your mongodb database okay cool so Let's go ahead and take a look at deleting records from the database. This one uh, might seem a little bit tricky, but it actually isn't because there are methods that support deleting records from the database. So I'll go back into the user's controller and I'll use the delete de decorator to specify that our endpoint is going to be a delete request. So I'm going to import that decorator from nestjs slash common. And then I'm going to use route parameters as well for this to specify the id of the record we're trying to delete okay so I'm, i also don't necessarily need um a request body because we really are just trying to delete a record we're not trying to um you know we're not really trying to expect the request body so we don't need to do any validation for that so we're not going to create any detail for that okay so what I'll do is I will create a method called delete user. And then what I'll do is right over here in the arguments, I'll use the app param decorator, grab the ID, the same way that we did it for update user and get user by ID. So ID is going to be a string. And then we will perform validation of the ID. So I'm just going to pretty much just copy and paste these two lines because it is pretty redundant at this point. And we don't have any middleware set up. So what I'll do is after we do the validation check and if it gets to this part over here, we know that the ID is valid. So let's go back to users.service.ts. Let's create a delete user method. It's going to take in one argument, which is going to be the ID of the user we're going to delete. So for the method that we're going to invoke on the user model, it's going to be very similar to this find by ID and update, but instead there's actually a method called find by id and delete and we're going to use that so we'll just pass in the id so it'll search for the user by its id if it's a, if it's there it's going to go and delete it if it's not there then it'll return null okay so let's go ahead and move on let's go back to the user's controller file and we're going to do the very same thing that we did over here on line 52 and line 53 so We'll declare a variable called const deleted user. And we need to use async await. So let me add the async keyword in front of this delete user method. So I'll await this users service dot delete user call. And we're going to just pass in the ID just like that. Okay. So 
what I'll do is I'll just console log this for now. Just to verify that it is going to be a null value if we pass in some kind of uh, ID that does not exist in the database. So I'm going to go back into, let's see, let me remove this patch request. I'm going to go back and copy this ID. So I'm going to delete Anson from the database. So let me create a new request. So this will be delete request. And I'm just going to go to slash users and then the ID. So now if I click send, so this should actually delete it from the database and you'll see that the record is being logged. And this is coming from line 62 where we are logging deleted user. If I refresh, you can see that uh, that record is no longer in the database. Now, if I try to, let's say if I tried to use the same idea again, okay, the, 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 the idea is valid, but it doesn't exist in the database. And you can see over here that it is returning null. So it is in fact returning null. So let's just go ahead and finish this last part where we check to see if there's no deleted user or if it's not null. Okay, then we'll throw new HTTP exception, user not found, return a 404 status code. You don't necessarily really need to return anything. So you can just do return and this will just give back a 200 status code. So that indicates that everything is good. So that means the user has been deleted. Okay, and we return a status code of 200. So that's deleting users. So, so far you all know how to create the user, get users, get user, get user, get the user by ID, update the user by ID, delete the user by ID. So hopefully all of this was pretty straightforward. I know this was a pretty lengthy video, but I wanted to fit in as much as I can. And what I would encourage you, encourage you all next to do is to take this source code that we just went through. Uh, it's going to be on GitHub. Use it as a resource and try to build on top of it. Because now you have an actual full working CRUD API that can perform a bunch of different types of operations on a record. Now, one more thing that I do want to show you all how to do with Mongoose and with MongoDB and NestJS is I want to show you how you can have a model reference another model or a schema referencing another schema. So what I mean by that is sometimes you might come into a situation where you will need relational data. So for example, you might have a user record that needs a user settings record being referenced. And the user settings record will have fields such as receive notifications, receive emails, uh, receive text, receive SMS, same thing as receive text, things like that as an example. Of course, you don't want to put all those fields inside one single um, document you want them in their own uh, document in its own collection. And this is known as encapsulation because it makes sense to encapsulate, um, you know, a group of fields that are relevant to its model. Okay. So for example, we will create a user settings schema and then we'll do the same thing that we did with our user schema as well. And then I'm going to have a reference inside my user class over here. It'll reference a user settings model. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to go ahead and create a new file and I'll call this user settings.schema.ts. And we're just going to create another class. So export class user settings. Okay. And then we will use the schema decorator to mark this as a schema. And then what I'll do is I'll keep this very simple. So I'll use the prop decorator. And I'll have a receive notifications uh, field that will be optional. And this will be set to a Boolean value. Uh, let me also make sure I set required set to false as well. I'll do the same thing uh, for, let's see, receive notifications, receive emails is the other field that I want. And I'll do one more. Uh, let's do receive sms for text messages okay and these are all going to be uh, optional of course because typically with settings you want them to be optional okay some settings of course are required but in general uh, you want the user to be able to enable and disable their settings okay but by default the settings field will be undefined 
So what I'll do is I'll create that user settings schema variable. And the same thing that we have for our user schema on the left hand side, I'm going to do the same thing for the right hand side. So I need to reference schema factory and call create for class and then pass in the user settings class. So remember this create for class actually creates the schema itself and then assigns it to this user settings schema variable, which we export. So now we need to register our schema. So we're going to go into the users.module.ts file. So where we have mongoose module dot for feature, this is where we, this is where we registered one uh, model definition for a user. We're going to register another one because this is an array, and I'll just pass in the name, which will be user settings. So I'm going to import that class that we just created, and I'm going to reference that name property that is on that class. And then we're going to set the schema property to be the user settings schema value. So that's just the schema that was just created and exported this thing right over here. Okay, so the same thing that we did for user, we're doing for user settings. All right, so we're not quite done yet. We do need to go back to the user class itself. And what we need to do is we need to define a reference to that user settings uh, document itself or that user settings uh, type, if you want to call it, okay? And it's, it's actually very, very simple. So all we do is we simply just use this at prop decorator, and then we pass in this prop options object, and we set the type, and the type is going to be mongoose. So we need to import mongoose from mongoose, right up top over here. So mongoose dot schema dot types, dot object ID. And then you need to set this ref property and you're going to reference user settings. So the name of the class itself. Okay. And then uh, you're just going to define the, the field name. So I'll just call it settings. This is also going to be uh, optional as well or possibly undefined. And then the type will just be the class user settings. And there you have it. So the way that this is going to work is the actual um, data type that it's going to appear in the MongoDB database, it's going to appear as a string. And when you actually retrieve the user record, if the settings field is set, it's not going to actually resolve into an object right away. It's going to be an ID. Uh, well, in fact, the, the object ID of the relevant user settings document. Okay, so whatever that user settings document ID is that is related to the user, that is going to be the ID set to this settings field. So what you need to do in order to get that ID turned into an actual object or resolved into an actual object for the user settings is you need to actually populate it. And I'll show you how to do that as well. Okay, but if, if that didn't really make any sense, don't worry, um, you'll, you'll see what I mean in just a second. So this is all we need to do to provide a reference to user settings. Okay, so now let's go ahead and close all of this out. We just uh, set up our schema, we registered it, and then we also referenced inside our user class, we referenced the user settings, just like this. We provided a reference for user settings for our MongoDB database. So I'm gonna keep everything simple. So I'm gonna go into users controller, and what I'll do is since I already have a uh, create user method, and I also have this create user DTO, I'm just gonna make it so that when we create a user, I'm also going to allow them to um, set the settings at the same time as well, just to keep everything simple. Ideally though, what you really should do is you should create separate endpoints uh, for dealing with user settings. So it's gonna be in its own entire domain. And then those separate endpoints will have stuff like create settings, update settings, et cetera, things like that. And then that's how you should actually create the user settings and then link it with the user it belongs to. But I wanna keep things simple, so I'm just gonna do it this way. So what I'll do is I'm gonna go inside create user DTO and I'm gonna go ahead and set this settings property right here. And I'm gonna type annotate this with a class that I have not created yet, but that we will create right now. And I'll just create inside here and I'll just call it uh, create 
user settings DTL. So let me just take this and type annotate settings with that. Okay. So what I want to do is for create user settings DTO, I want to specify all of the possible settings that we can allow um, the user to uh, set when they are creating the user. So we only have three fields, so we just allow all three of these fields to um, be set when they are creating the user. So receive notifications, which is optional. So that'll be Boolean. And I'll do the same thing for receive emails and receive SMS. So e receive emails and then receive SMS. And these are all going to be Booleans. Same thing as our user settings model for our schema. Okay, so now we need to uh, mark each one of these fields as optional. These are not required, of course. So is optional. And then we'll use this is Boolean validator. So that's going to be imported from class validator to ensure that if they do set this field, in the settings object then it must be a boolean so i'll do the same thing for the rest so we did the same thing for receive emails and receive sms so now down over here for this settings property okay we need to mark this as is optional so that way it allows the user or the client that is making a post request to our endpoint uh, the ability to either set this settings object or not Okay, and of course, even if they do specify this settings um, property, and let's say if they just pass in an empty object, which is going to be totally fine because all three of these fields are optional. Okay, now here's the thing though, since we are validating or trying to validate a nested object, because technically these two are uh, primitive values, scalar values, if you might say, but this right over here is not a scalar value, it's an object, so we need to make sure that we are doing nested validation and to do that we can use this validate nested decorator and that is going to be imported right up, right up top over here so this will ensure that it will actually uh, validate all of these fields as well okay so now that we have all this working and remember we don't really need to change anything with our controller because we only we have modified the DTO uh, type definition to include settings, okay? So now all we have to do is just go back to Postman and test this out. So I'm going back to Postman right now and I'm making a post request to uh, the slash users endpoint right over here. I'm gonna send a request body. So let's do username, let's do Anson1. Okay, it's not gonna pass any settings at all. It just works just fine, okay? Now, if I do pass settings right now, though, it's actually going to throw an error because we do need to modify our um, our service layer. And I'll explain why. So right now, if you look at the logs, you're going to see it says user validation failed. Cast object ID failed for value. So what's going on is it's throwing an error because, first of all, uh, let me go into the user service. Okay, so right over here. So we're actually trying to set the settings at the same time while we're trying to create the user. And you can't do it that way because you actually need that user settings record in the database already in order to link it with this user. So what's really happening is we're passing in this whole entire user DTO, create user DTO object. And so it's passing in the username, display name, and then settings. And then it's trying to set the settings like this. Okay. But we need this user settings record in the database first before we can even link it with this user. So what we need to do is we need to modify this whole create user logic to check to see, first of all, we need to check to see if the user is trying to create the user with settings. If they are, then we need to first create the user settings and then we can create the user and then link the user settings ID with the user. If they're not trying to create the user with user settings, then we can just perform these two lines and we're done. So here's what I'll do. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, take this create user DTO object and I'm gonna destructure it at the argument level. So by doing it like this, so pair of curly braces, and then I'm simply just going to zoom in a little bit so you all can see better. So I'm gonna go ahead and take the settings object and then I'm going to use the spreader operator to pack all of the remaining 
field. So everything except for settings, because we destructured settings first. So think of it like we're taking settings out of the box, and then everything that's left in the box is going to be stored inside this variable that I'm just going to name create user DTO. Okay, so username and display name will be left inside that box analogy that I referenced, but it'll be stored inside this create user DTO object. So this is a good way to pretty much kind of like take properties out of an object, if that makes sense. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll check to see if settings is defined. And you can see settings has all of these three possible properties. So if settings is defined, what we will do first is we'll create a record of settings in the database. So to do that, we need the user settings uh, model. So the same way that I injected it, injected the user model inside the constructor or inside the constructor arguments, I'll do, I'll do the same for uh, user settings. So at inject model, and then I'm going to import that user settings class right up top over here and then reference that name property. Okay. And remember this, whatever you pass into this inject model decorator. So in this case, I'm passing in user settings name. It needs to match what you set for name over here. That's how it recognizes which correct model to inject. Okay. So we're going to, uh, whoops, private. And I'm going to call this argument user settings model and then type annotate it to be model user settings like this. So cool, we have our user settings model injected. So let's just make sure there's no errors. Okay, good. Let's go back into our code. So inside the, the if block for if settings, what we want to do is we want to create the settings. So const new settings equals new this dot user settings model. So this is how I can create my new user settings record and save it to the database. Well, not save it. We're going to do that part next. So I'm going to pass in the settings object into user settings model. Okay. And what I'll do now is I need to save new settings or the new user settings by simply calling the dot save method like this. But because this returns a promise and we still need to use the return value of the saved record to a database to link it with the new user that we're creating we need to use async await to get that resolved value so i'm going to add the async keyword in front of create user and then what i'll do is i'll declare a variable called saved uh, new settings equals await new settings save okay so now the saved user settings is now in this variable right over here and i can reference properties on this but we specifically need to get the id okay so now that we've created our user settings and then we um, save it to the database we can actually create the user itself so we're just going to do the same thing down over here so const new user equals new this dot user model so for the argument for user model, we're going to pass in a new object. We're going to unpack all of the fields from create user DTO into this new object. So like this, create user DTO. And then what I need to do is I need to set the settings. So this is where you can see how it, like in TypeScript, it's expecting this to be an object, but it's actually supposed to be the, the object ID of our save, set, save new settings. So that's actually the reason why we had an error in the first place. So this needs to be an object ID. So saved new settings dot ID like this. Okay. So this will pretty much create the new user and also set the settings property to the ID of our newly created user settings. And then we can return new user dot save. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense. And if you don't really understand what's going on with this destructuring part, or I'm sorry, not destructuring this the spreader operator part, you need to look up how spreader operators work because it's a very important thing to kind of like understand really well in, in JavaScript TypeScript. But just once again, ideally, we're just pretty much taking the fields, username and display name, and then it's pretty much taking them and then setting it as if we're doing it like this username and then display name like that. Okay, but it's taking those fields and values from the create user DTO. So I just wanted to mention that just in case some of you might be confused. 
All right, so now we can test everything out. So if, if we've done everything correctly, which it seems like we did, we should not get any errors. So I'm going to leave settings as an empty object right now. Click send. And now you'll see that because we specified settings, but we marked it as an empty object, it's still going to create that user settings uh, document in the user settings collection in our database. Uh, but it's just going to be an empty document. It's going to have no properties set. Okay. We still, but notice how we still have this underscore ID or not, sorry, not, not here. This one right over here, this settings property and this ID right over here. This ID is the ID of the settings record. And if you don't believe me, I'll show you right now. Let's go into our MongoDB uh, GUI and I'm going to go to user settings. And right now you can see, I just refreshed. You'll see that uh, the corresponding ID, let's see, 656D5, BC1 is what it ends with. So uh, there's only three right over here. BC1, okay, this is the correct one. And notice how none of those fields are set. And that's okay because remember we marked it as optional. So we are ensuring that our uh, validation is working right over here. Okay, is optional. So, but since we did set settings, it did create a settings record, but then it didn't care because it didn't care that it was empty because all of these fields are optional. Now notice how if I were to remove is optional from receive SMS, and if I try to create this now, let me change this to Anton three. Uh, it should actually throw an error. I'm not sure why it didn't. Um, hmm, that's weird. I think I forgot to do one more thing. So uh, I need to use this type decorator from class transformer. And then I need to pass in this function. And this is going to just be the create user settings DTO. Just like that. I think that's the reason why. Let me try again because that should have thrown an error. Okay, there we go. Now, now it works. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. I, I completely missed that. So we need at validate validate nested and then we also need this at type and then pass in this uh callback function and then just the return type is just going to be whatever the dto that you're trying to validate so it's just going to be the same thing as this record here create user settings dto okay so uh, hopefully that makes sense and now we can see that it is throwing an error so receive sms must be a boolean value okay so that's good let me just go back and mark this as optional Okay, cool. So let me go back and create a new user with settings. So let's set receive notifications to true. Click send. And so now I have my settings ID that relates to this user record right over here. And I can go into the database and I can look for that. And it's going to be this one right over here. And it's an F7. Yep, F7. Okay. So now here's the question though. I want to be able to retrieve the user, but also have this settings not be an ID, but be the actual object itself. Because if I go and try to query this user, so let me get the user ID. So I'm going to copy this right over here. And let's just say, for example, whoops, let me go over to here. Let's just say if I try to grab the user by its ID, see how right now I get everything um, but the settings property is mapping to the ID and I don't want that. I want the actual string. How can we do that? Well, what we can do is we can go back to our users.service.ts file and then let's go into get user by ID. Okay. So this is where we are searching for the user by ID. At the end, we can go ahead and call this populate method. And then all you need to do is just specify the path of the property of the field that you want to populate. Okay, so in our case, we only have one field called settings that we want to populate. So we just pass in settings like that. But you might have complicated, uh, you might have like a complicated reference structure where you might have a bunch of nested objects. So let's say, for example, if settings had a reference to another document um, or another model, uh, you would just do settings dot and then name of that model like this or the name of that property okay name of that property that references that model so that's how you can populate these nested objects
So if I go back to Postman, if I get this user, see how now it gets me the actual entire document, not just the ID. I have an actual object now. And I can do the same thing for uh, getting all the users. So if I try to get all the users right now, you can see that users that do have settings set, they're just strings, and that's okay. We can simply go back over here, call populate, populate the settings field. So at the end of this dot user model dot find inside the get users method, I'm calling dot populate the same thing that I did down below for get user by ID. So now if I query all the users, all of these settings should be populated. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. So now one thing that I do want to show you all before I end this video that I think is very important are one-to-many relationships in MongoDB. So far, we did a one-to-one -one relationship with user and user settings. And it should make sense because the user can only be associated with user settings or at most one user settings document and vice versa. User settings can only be associated with at most one user record or user document. So that is a one-to-one -one relationship. When you have a relationship that is one to many or many to one, uh, I'll give you an example. So a user might have many posts, but a post will at most only have one user. Okay, so if you're thinking of like a blog platform, you're the user, you're going to create a blog post. Now you have, let's say, one blog post. And then you create another blog post, now you have two. So that's a one to many relationship example. Okay, a user can have many posts, but a post can only belong to one user. A post can, there are cases where a post can belong to multiple users. Okay, that would be an example of a many-to-many -many relationship. So like, let's say if you allow a post to be collaborated between multiple users, then that would be an example of a many-to-many. -many. But we're gonna keep it simple. We're gonna keep it as a one-to-many, many-to-one relationship. So what I'll do is I'll set up a new schema for um, our current application. I'm gonna to try to keep it as simple as possible. So what I'll do is I will go ahead and set up a post schema, which will represent uh, posts in an application like blog posts or social media posts as an example. So post.schema.ts. And then what I'll do is I'll simply go ahead, and whoops, I didn't mean to open that. I simply go ahead and create a new class called post and then use the schema decorator to annotate this as a schema. I am going to require two fields to be uh, valid or present. So we need title and description. And we'll just leave it like that for now. Or I should actually change the contents, not description. Okay, and then I'll use the prop decorator for this and we'll set, we'll pass in some options. We'll set required to true. And same thing for contents as well. Prop required true. So that way these are not null. And then I'll go ahead and create this post schema variable. And then we need to reference schema factory. So I'm going to import that up here and then call create for class. So this will actually create the actual post schema. So we just pass in that post class and then it will assign the post schema to this variable right over here. Okay. So now that we've done that, uh, what we want to do is we want to reference this post right over here inside user. Okay, now, like I said, typically you can uh, create like a separate model or separate schema for author because typically it's an author as a post, not a user. But I'm going to keep this very simple. So I just want to, I'm just going to do it inside this user schema because we, we already have it already. Okay. So since this is going to be a one to many relationship, this indicates that the user will have uh, a bunch of posts which typically the data type for that is going to be an array. So first thing I'll do is I'll set this posts field to be an array of posts. So I'm going to import that post class from this file right over here, post.schema.ts. Okay, I just imported that. 
and I'm going to set this to be post array like that. So that way TypeScript knows that this is going to be an array. Then we need to tell MongoDB that this is also going to be a one-to-many relationship. So we use this app prop decorator. And then it's going to be very similar to how we did it for user settings. Okay, so I'll show you. So we're going to set type to be, okay, and it's going to be square brackets like this. And then pass in this object and then set type to be mongoose.schema.types.objectID. And then ref, and then the name of the post class like this. So it's very similar to how we did it up top over here, but this is for multiple posts. So this is going to be an array of posts, okay? So really what's what's actually it's gonna look like in the document is this is going to be an array of object IDs, not array of post objects, but an array of object IDs, okay? And remember how earlier when we were uh, trying to retrieve the record for user settings. It was giving us back the uh, settings ID when we tried to retrieve the user record. But what we did was we populated that user settings uh, field, that settings field, and then it gave us back the entire um, object itself. So this is going to be an array of all of the IDs, but if we use the populate method, it will give us, it will resolve all the IDs into the actual corresponding post objects. Okay, so I just wanted to mention that. So now that we have this relationship set up, now we need to actually just, uh, first we need to register our post schema. Okay, um, so what I wanna do is I wanna create a completely new controller service and uh, module, just because you know we really shouldn't be keeping everything in one single module and post is in its own domain. So I'm gonna create an entirely new module for post, okay? So let's create a new folder, we'll call this posts. And I'll create a new file called posts.module.ts. And then it's gonna be very similar to our users module. Uh, so what I'll do, is let me close all this. I'm just going to use the module decorator, export class posts module and then we need to import module from at nestjs common and then we're going to need to specify the imports controllers and providers okay so let's start off with the post schema because we need to register that inside the module that we're using it which is going to be post module so we're going to need to import mongoose module from at nestjs slash mongoose and then call for feature and then pass in this array of model definitions. And it's exactly the same way that we did it in users module like this. So nothing new. So I'm just set the name. I'm gonna import that post class and set the name to post.name. And then for the schema property, I'm gonna set it to post, post schema like this. Okay, next let's go ahead and create the controller. So inside the post folder, uh, posts.controller.ts. So I'm gonna import controller from at nsjs slash common, and then export class posts controller. And then I'll use the controller decorator to indicate that this class is a controller and I'll set the route to be posts okay so this will map the slash posts endpoint to this entire controller right over here uh, let me go ahead and just simply create the service just so that we have everything so posts.service.ts and then we need the injectable decorator which is also imported from at nsjs slash common and then we just create the class post service okay before i implement any methods let me just import the controller and the service and pass it into the corresponding uh, arrays so for controllers i'm going to import post controller so that's going to be imported up over here and then we're going to pass that as a value inside this array 
Same thing for the providers, so post service, like this right over here. Import post service and then pass as a provider inside this providers array. Okay, so that should be pretty much it for this post module. So we'll start with our post service class, our injectable, and then we'll go into the controller and set up the route. So first I'm gonna inject the post model. So I'm gonna use this constructor and inside the args, I'm gonna use inject model. And it's gonna be imported from at nestjs slash mongoose. I'm gonna import the post class and then reference a name. And then I'm gonna go ahead and do private post model. And then I'm gonna type annotate it with the generic model type that comes from the mongoose, the base mongoose package. So import model from mongoose. And this is a generic type, so I can set this to post like this. So this is how we inject our model. And we should not have any errors in our logs, so that's good. So we should be able to begin using um, these uh, this model to interact with the database, okay? Or the, uh, the post collection database. So I can do create post. I can do find posts find posts, things like that, find post by ID, stuff like that, okay? I'll just do create post for now. So create post is going to need the object um, that is going to be used to uh, create the actual post itself. So we need, of course, uh, an object that has title and contents, okay? So what I'll do now is I'll go ahead and Go back to the posts controller and I'll set up a post endpoint. So let's do controller. Let's import the post decorator. Okay. And I will simply do create post. So now we need a DTO to represent the request body, the data transfer object that's coming from the client to the server. So I'll create a new folder inside the posts folder called DTOs, similar to how we did it for users. And I'll create a new file called create post.dto.ts. And this will be a class called create post DTO. And then it'll just simply have the title and contents field. And then we'll use decorators from class validator. So is string is not empty. And I can also set a max length as well. So max length, set the max length to be 100 characters. Okay, and then I'll do the same thing for contents. I want this to also be a string. I'm going to use the is string decorator from class validator. Is not empty. And then max length, uh, let's just say 500. Okay, that's pretty much it for that. So let's go back into our controller. And then... We'll grab the request body by using the body decorator. So I'm going to import that from at nestjs slash common. So post or create post DTO. Type annotate that with our DTO class that we just created. And then we need to inject the service, the post service into post controller in order to actually call this create post method and pass in create post DTO. So let's inject the service, which is very easy. Private uh, post service, post service, like that. Okay, nothing new here. And now what I'll do, uh, since I don't have the logic implemented yet, I'm just simply going to go ahead and call this dot post service dot create post. And I do need to update this method this method signature. So I'm going to just take create post DTO and pass it in like that. And the error should go away once I update this. So back in our post service class for create post, I'm going to update the signature to take in this create post DTO type. So I'm going to type annotate it with the create post DTO class. So now let's actually create the model and save it to the database. So we're going to declare a variable called const new post equals new this dot post model and then pass and create post detail 
and then we just do return new post dot save and that is pretty much it so let's go ahead and just test out this uh endpoint so we're gonna make a post request to slash posts okay make sure our, our api has no errors good um let's see oh i forgot one more thing i apologize i think i may have forgot to register the posts module into the app.module.ts our root module so let me do that that no wonder why it the logs didn't say uh the post endpoint was uh mapped so let me go into the imports right underneath users module i'm going to do post posts module save and let's just make sure there are no errors good and now we see posts controller is right over here it's resolved so the route should exist so let's go into postman and let's go and create a new tab we'll do a post request to uh, localhost port 3000 slash posts okay if i click send uh, let's see what's going on okay yeah so it does throw an error uh, of course that's because we passed in an empty object but the database is expecting title and contents to be there i did also forget one more thing i forgot to also enable validation for create post okay because we don't have validation enabled globally we have to enable it manually for each endpoint so we're just going to do that for create post i'll do at use pipes so this is the use pipes decorator which is going to be imported from at nestjs slash common and then we just pass in this instance of new validation whoops validation pipe it should look similar to uh i can just import validation pipe yep validation pipe right over here so what i did was i imported validation pipe and then i just created this instance and passed it into use pipes like that so new validation pipe okay so now it should actually just throw a 400 instead and give us these validation errors which is fine because that's what's supposed to happen let's actually pass in a request body so let's pass in a uh, title uh let's say hello world and then contents hello world click send and now we get our very first post created in the database but here's the thing though we are creating posts but we're not linking it to the user because this post exists in the database let me show you very very quickly inside my database uh gui i can see this post collection right over here and it exists okay but here's the problem though we don't know who this post belongs to okay and currently it doesn't belong to anyone because it's not linked to any user so we need to make sure we are also linking the new post that was created to a particular user so now how do we do that okay it's actually pretty simple but here's the thing though because we don't have any authentication we don't have any state uh with our http requests there's no way we know um you know who the current user is in the session um so we do need to just for demonstration purposes we do need to take in a user id so that way we know who the user is that this post belongs to if you have authentication in your application already then you can very easily figure out who the user is by just simply getting that data from the session data okay but i am going to modify my create post dto and i'm going to take in this uh i'm going to just call this user id which is going to be a string so is string and is not empty okay so we'll pass in the user id that we want to link this post to so this will require us to modify our logic just a little bit so we do need to modify our create post logic uh, just a little bit because we are creating the model but we're not linking that model to uh, the existing user okay since now that we have the user id that's going to be sent in the request body when we try to create a post we can easily take that id and search for that user the, the user id search for it in the database and if it exists then we can link the post but in order to of course search for the user we do need the user uh, model so i can just simply inject that inside post service so uh, i'm going to go ahead and just copy this whole thing right over here just to save some time and paste it right down over here but i'm going to just change everything up so i'm going to replace this with user i'm going to import the user class okay from the schemas folder so i can reference user.name and i'm going to change this from post model to user model 
and I'm going to change this generic type from model post to model user. So now we have post model and then we have user model. Okay, we are going to get an error, of course, because we need to register the user module or I'm sorry, the user model inside uh, this posts module. Okay, because currently we are in a different scope of our uh, application. Right now we're in the posts module. Okay, and we only have the post uh, schema, the post model registered within this posts module. Okay, we did register user and user settings, but that's inside the users module. Okay, now what you could do is you could actually take this whole thing, copy it, and then add it as an exports. You don't have to do it, and I wouldn't really recommend, especially if you have a lot of um, schemas registered inside this module, because you might be importing a bunch of registered schemas that you don't necessarily need. So I think it's just better to just register whatever you need inside uh, your module. So I'm going to go inside posts.module.ts and I'll register the user model. So I'll just import user inside posts.module.ts right up top over here. Reference.name. And for the schema, we're going to import user schema from that same path right over here. Okay, source schemas user.schema. So now that error should go away and it does. So now we can actually interact with our uh, users collection inside the scope of our posts module. Okay, so what we'll do inside our create post method is we'll search for the user first. Okay, so um, I'll grab the user ID from create post DTO. Uh, well, actually, let me do this. Let me destructure this like this. Let me get the user ID and then the rest of the properties will be stored in create post DTO. Okay. And then what I'll do is I'll search for the user. So const uh, find user equals, and then we need to use async await. So I'll add the async keyword in front of create post method. So await this dot user model dot find by ID, and then pass in the user ID like this. Okay. If there's no user, we can actually just return. Um, or throw an error here. Um, I'll just do this. If there's no user, I'll return null. And then I'll take care of the error handling inside the controller layer. I could actually just throw the error here and then the uh, the exception layer will take care of handling the error. Okay. So, you know what? Why don't I just do this? Throw new HTTP exception. Uh, user Oops, user not found, port four. Okay, so then what I'll do is if the user is found, we will go ahead and create the post. Okay, we'll save the post. Um, instead of returning this just yet, uh, here's what I'll do. Right before we return the new post, uh, well, actually, I'm sorry, I need to save this. So const saved post equals await. And then what I can do is, since I already have this find user document already, I can just do find user, and then I can go ahead and just call update one. And then what I wanna do is, uh, let's see, I don't need the ID because we already know which user we're gonna update already. But what I do need is I need this push operator because we want to basically push to the posts array for find user okay and the right way to do this is to use these uh these queries push to actually allow it to modify the array for you instead of just doing you know find user dot posts dot push okay so for this you just need to target the specific property you want to update so in this case it's just posts like this and then uh you just want to pass in the post ID, okay, because remember, this is going to be an array of IDs, object IDs for the post, not an array of post objects, okay? So posts, and then we'll do new post, or I'm sorry, save post, uh, and then dot ID like this. So there's that, and this should be asynchronous as well, I believe. Yes, so 
uh, const updated user equals await. And I think that should be it. Yeah, I don't think we need to save anything. I don't think we need to save anything because this will pretty much update and save it as well. Okay, so we will just return saved post and let's just see what happens with everything. So let's go into our endpoint or postman. Let's go and send the user ID now. So let me go into, let's see, MongoDB. Let's go into our users and let's do, let's do Jack. Okay. So user ID. Okay. So we do uh, not get any errors. So that's good. Let's go into our database. Okay. So you see how now when I re after I refresh, you can see that this document for the username of Jack, let me see if I can zoom in a little bit. You can see now it has this posts array and it has this object ID in there. Okay. And then if I refresh post, it's just going to look like a regular document. Okay. You know, nothing about the author from here. But if you go over here, you can get all of the, you can get the array of post IDs. Okay, so now if I go back into, uh, let's see, let's go into here. Let's get all users. You can see now uh, when I query all users, I get this posts um, array, which is an array of IDs. And similar, similar to how we populate the settings field, we can populate the post field as well. So it's very simple. I'll show you how to do that. So what I'll do is I'll go to, let's see. I'll go to users, users controller, or I'm sorry, users.service.ts. So all I'll do is for populate, I think populate only takes in, uh, let's see, I think populate only takes in, it's hard to read this sometimes. I think it does take, it might take in an array, I think. Let me just double check. Yeah, it takes in an array as well, a string or an array. So I can pass in settings and I can also pass in posts as well like this. So let's go ahead and get all the users again. And this time you'll see that I have all the posts populated. Um, let's try this. Let's, let's do one with settings and posts. So I'll take this user right over here. Ants in three. I'll create a post right now for ants in three. Let's grab all the users. And now you can see for ants in three, all of the settings are popular. The settings object is populated and the posts array is populated with all of the post records. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense. And hopefully that shows you all how you can deal with one to many and many to one relationships. Okay. So I hope that makes sense and i hope you all learned a lot from this tutorial i really enjoyed making this video it's probably one of the most requested tutorials on this channel for nest.js with mongodb so i'm i was really happy uh that i got a chance to make this video for you all so i hope you all enjoyed this video the code will be in the description so you all can use this as a reference um, if you like the video, of course, please leave a like down below, leave a comment. If you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. And uh, feel free to subscribe to my channel if you wish to see more similar videos like this. I am posting more NestJS tutorials now, and I will also be posting some other videos uh, with Express as well. So that's going to be pretty much it for this whole tutorial. I appreciate all of you for watching, and I'll see you in my next video. Peace out.